Welcome back to your personal phlebotomy guru. I'm your host, Dennis Ernst. Last month, we started a series we call If Tubes Could Talk with an interview with a delightful chap, Mr. Blue Top, a sodium citrate tube. We not only found that tubes can talk, but they have a lot to say. We got an earful from Mr. Blue Top, and I encourage you to watch the interview in its entirety, to which I've linked below in the description of this segment. Today, we're delighted to hear what our next guest has to say. Let me introduce to you our next in our cast of characters. Mr. Redtop is on the line. Randy Redtop, welcome to the program. Thank you. Let's get on with it. I've got a lot of things to do. <laughs> well, okay then. Let's get on with it. We wouldn't want to keep you from something important. So what exactly do you do and why does it keep you so busy? I am a red top tube. I clot. You clot. Well, that doesn't sound so difficult. You just sit there and let nature take its course, right? You're not real bright, are you? What do you think I'm made of? Glass? I'm plastic. That means I have a clot activator that gets the clotting going. It's not that easy. So that means you yield serum instead of plasma, right? Hey, that's good. You're smarter than I thought. From the moment blood enters me, the irreversible process of clotting begins. The clot activator in me starts a chain reaction called the coagulation cascade, which you've probably never heard of. One reaction triggers another, which triggers another and another, all culminating in the production of the final product, fibrin. Uh, what's fibrin? And you call yourself a guru. You must have fallen off your mountaintop and hit your head. Listen up. Fibrin is the strong network of protein filaments that forms over a cut to stop the bleeding, and it keeps bacteria out. It ultimately leads to a healed wound, like when you hit your head. When blood is collected in a tube like me, fibrin still forms. But somewhere in history, somebody figured out that if you fill a tube with blood, let it clot, then centrifuge it, the liquid portion of the blood rises to the top and contains an encyclopedia of information about the patient's health. An encyclopedia? Yeah, a big book with lots of information. You can read, can't you? Well, yeah, I'm reading you pretty well. Well, let's see if you can listen then. As the process unfolds, the blood in me becomes gel-like in consistency. If I'm allowed to sit long enough, my clotting factors are consumed, and I become a dense network of fibrin that binds up all of the cells. In order to get the serum within the clot separated from the network, I have to be centrifuged. The inertia of centrifugation pushes the network of fibrin and the cells trapped in it to the bottom of the tube, and the liquid part of the blood rests to the top. That's serum. Oh, a, a dense network. Well, <laughs> I'll agree with that. Uh, are you the only tube that yields serum? Well, actually, no. I have a brother with a gold top and a sister with a speckled top. We all do the same thing, but Mom always liked me best. <laughs> oh, I'll bet she did. Okay, then. Let's take some callers. We have Shan on the line from Springville, Utah. Welcome to the program, Shan. Thanks, Dennis. Mr. Redtop, I'm an instructor and my students always wonder why they have to wait 20 to 30 minutes for clotting to take place when tubes like you look clotted after only five minutes. They argue that after five or 10 minutes, the blood isn't liquid anymore, so it should be clotted. What is the best way to explain that just because you look clotted, it doesn't mean that you actually are? Thank you, Shan. I was hoping somebody would ask me that. You are correct to tell them that it can take up to 30 minutes for me to clot. The myth is that just because the blood has gelled, it's fully clotted, but that's not a good indicator. I gel up long before clotting is complete. Trust me, I know what goes on inside me. I see it firsthand. If I'm spun as soon as I look clotted, well, you'll get lousy separation and... The serum above the cells will be full of fibrin and cells. That's bad, right? Yeah, that's bad. Boy, you really hit your head hard, didn't you? When you don't give me time to clot in the rack, upright I might add, I'll keep on clotting while I'm spinning in the centrifuge. After I'm pulled out, you won't be able to use me because the serum is still clotting. The gelatinous strands you see above the cells are fibrin, continuing to form. 
Uh, yeah, but you're made of plastic. That means you have a clot activator that hastens clotting, right? It's a clot activator, not a clot accelerator. Mm, okay, what's the difference? Boy, for someone who writes books on phlebotomy, you, you don't know too much. Look, clot activators are additives that contain silica or other substances to make sure clotting is complete. But it doesn't accelerate clotting. It only activates it and helps it go to completion so that the lab ends up with a nice, clean serum specimen that's free of fibrin. Well, let's take another caller. We have uh, Jesse online from Oregon. Hello, Dennis. I'm from Southern Oregon, and I work in a lab where I supervise a few people who have had some issues with the red tops. And we've ha had an argument back and forth a little bit about spinning them twice. And my uh, suggestion is that we spin them off and send them to the lab, uh, poured off. And the company says that's too cost prohibitive. I personally feel like that's the way we should do it. Can you give us an idea, possibly, how we should handle it and all of the, you know, bottom lines for everybody? Well, don't respin me. Don't ever respin me. It makes me dizzy. Once is enough. You need to know that if it's been more than two hours since I was first spun, the serum below the gel barrier has changed. Most notably, the potassium leaks out of the red cells and elevates the level within the serum. Since red cells are rich in potassium, it doesn't take long. Spin me a second time and you add bad serum to good serum. Never trust any potassium result from a tube centrifuged twice, especially if it's been a while between spins. We red tops have a saying, it's not nice to spin me twice. So if we can't spin you right after clotting, can we refrigerate you? Oh, heavens no. That's even worse than spinning me twice. When I'm unspun and refrigerated, the potassium flies out of the red cells faster than at room temperature. We red tops have another saying. Refrigeration is for fish and vegetables, not red, gold, and speckled tops. <laughs> well, that's not very catchy. That doesn't even rhyme. But I get it. So uh, you can be refrigerated after centrifugation, though, right? Right. As long as the gel keeps the serum and cells separated. Don't all red tops have a gel? No, some don't. For those, the serum needs to be removed and placed in a transfer tube to prevent cell contact during transport or storage. So red tops are pretty important when it comes to treating patients. Incredibly important. In fact, I'm the most important tube in the rack. Oh, really? Well, we interviewed a blue top last month. He seemed to think he was pretty important. Blue top? <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's so full of himself. I bet he didn't waste any time telling you he's first in the order of draw, did he? Oh, you're right. Did you know I used to be first? Everything was going along just fine back when I was made of glass. Then some wiseacre decided I needed to be made of plastic. It was the end of my dominion over all the other tubes. I went from being the first tube in the order of draw to the second overnight. Blue Top's been gloating ever since. That really makes my blood boil. <laughs> Easy, Red Top. Can we get back to the interview? Just try to get a decent calcium result out of him. You can't. Do you realize what he does to calcium? It's unthinkable. That pompous chelator. <laughs> Settle down. You're going to lose your vacuum, buddy. Let's get back to clotting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just make sure you write down that I'm the most important tube in the rack. More tests are done on me than on any other tube. Well, I will. So why would being made of plastic require a change in the order of draw? You see, as I fill, the blood becomes mixed with the clot activator sprayed on my inside. When I'm removed from the needle, a tiny bit of the blood activator mixture can be transferred by the needle piercing the stopper and get into the next tube. If the next tube is a coag tube, like it used to be back in the day, well, then the additive carried over has the potential to alter the coag results. So in 2003, the wise guys at CLSI changed the standards and demoted me to come after Blue Top. <laughs> I, I know, I was one of the wise guys on the committee that made the change. 
Oh, so you're responsible, huh? This interview is over. Hey, wait a minute. It wasn't just me. In fact, the committee that made the change included representatives from all the U.S. Ma tube manufacturers, even the one who made you. So they all came to a consensus that drawing a plastic red top with a clot activator before a blue top, not a good idea. Surely you wouldn't want the patient's coming coag results to be inaccurate just so that you can keep your top spot on the order of draw, would you? No, no, you're right. It's not about me, it's about the patient. Well, that's better. Now, let's talk more about how important you are. Good idea. Uh, we have another caller. It's Karen from Colony, Nebraska. Welcome to the program, Karen. Uh, thank you. I'm a first-time caller, but a long-time listener. My question is about centrifuging and RPMs. I know it matters how fast you spawn, but I've heard that you can speed things up by increasing the RPM and decreasing the time of centrifugation, say from 10 minutes down to 3 or 5. Is that true? I mean, as long as the serum looks clear, that's all that matters, right? Not really. All tubes have to have the right G-force during centrifugation. Consider the G-force to be the tube's sweet spot. Give it too much and the red cells rupture. Too little and the gel won't separate the liquid from the solid, and the serum will be full of cells. So, no, you can't increase the speed and decrease the time without making the test results inaccurate, especially platelets and white cells, both of which release potassium into the serum, spiking the level that would be reported to the physician. Uh, centrifuges don't have a G-force, Red Top. They typically only have uh, time and RPM settings. So what's the proper G-force for Red Tops? Well, it's whatever the tube manufacturer recommends. Mine says 1300 G, but you're right, you just can't set the centrifuge at 1300. You have to set the RPM depending on what the distance will be from the rotor of the centrifuge to the bottom of the tube as it's spinning. That sounds complicated. Well, it really isn't. Most labs have an RCF nomograph, uh, which is a chart that uh, does the calculations for them, or they can call the manufacturer of the centrifuge to help them determine the right RPM for their model to obtain the recommended G-force. Well, that's just about all the time we have today, Randy. Thank you for being with us. I'll let you get back to your work activating coagulation cascades. And I'll let you get back to pretending you're some kind of guru. And try not to fall off your mountain anymore. It's not healthy. <laughs> okay, I'll remember to buckle up next time. Uh, anything else you'd like me to know? Yeah, Blue Top cheats on his taxes. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you're taking the high road in your dispute with Mr. Blue Top. Thanks to you and to all of our callers. Join us next time when we interview Mrs. Lolita Lavender. A purple top unlike any purple top you've ever seen or heard. I'm Dennis Ernst, once again reminding you, keep sticking to the standards.